In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear a great deal these days about the danger of living in echo chambers. We say what matters to us, and what we expect to have returned to us, is an echo, simply what we've already said. Nothing new can enter into this situation. It's, if you like, a very malign kind of recycling, not to any very good environmental effect in this case. And echo chambers are what we live in, in many areas of our lives. You could say, and this is probably what St. Paul is saying in this morning's epistle, you could say that the very nature of sinful behavior is living in a kind of moral echo chamber. We start with the self, we act out of the self's instincts and compulsions, and surprise, surprise, we end with the self and nothing else. Our own concerns, our own passions, compulsions, fears, and all the rest of it simply bounce back at us from the walls within which we live. And if there is such a condition as hell, it is surely that enclosure, that endless echo chamber, where nothing is allowed to interrupt us, nothing is allowed to change us, nothing is allowed to enter into this magically protected, hermetically sealed space in which my ego just gets on with what suits it. And of course, if nothing ever interrupts us, we can't hear what is said, we can't receive what is given. We can't hear an invitation, a word of love or affirmation. We can't be given the food that we need to grow. We're stuck with ourselves and we are quite literally bouncing off the walls as we sometimes say when we're in isolated and difficult situations and I guess that's a phrase which has been in some people's minds during the lockdown period. And that's what St Paul is analysing in this morning's epistle. And the key word perhaps in the epistle is fruit. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? You spent a lot of your life, says St Paul to the Christians in Rome, in echo chambers. Your own compulsions, your own fears, your own guilt, bouncing back at you from the walls. What fruit was there in all that? Did this produce anything new? Did it move you on? Well, evidently, no. And so Paul ends this passage with that great classical distinction between two kinds of logic in our lives. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Sin pays. That's to say, you put something in and you get something back. Unfortunately, in this case, what you put in is exactly what you get back. It's you. It's your little world. It's your concerns. It's your fears. It's your guilt, etc., etc. And as any computer scientist knows, the rule is garbage in, garbage out. If what you bring is just your bundle of anxieties, greed, passion, acquisitiveness, then what you get back is just that climate of fear, negativity, and ultimately destructiveness. That's the wage, garbage in, garbage out. And the way God works, and of course the way in which humanity itself really works when it's being human, is the opposite of that. Not putting something in and getting an exact replica back, but daring to open some kind of door so that a quite disproportionate gift arrives. And sometimes it helps to think of God in this respect, not so much in personal as in more than personal terms. We think of how other people give gifts to us, but maybe thinking of the way God's love operates, 
we should think of God as that atmosphere surrounding the little black box of our concerns and fears and guilt, seeking a way, and just as, as they say, water always seeks to find a way into a house, a room or whatever, and we all know that from our bitter experience, or drafts coming in under the windows in cold winters. If there's a gap, if there's any relaxation, the tight control of that black box, be sure the air and the water will find their way in. And when they've found their way in, there's really no stopping them. You can't, you can't simply assume that if there's a leak somewhere, you can control what's coming in. It'll come in whether you like it or not. And there's something about the way the grace of God works that is like that. You may remember that wonderful reading from Ezekiel, that we, which we sometimes have during the Easter vigil, where Ezekiel sees the image of the water flowing out from the temple. And at first he's wading through it, and then it's up to his knees, and then it's up to his waist, and then he realizes that this is not something you can cross from one side to the other, not something you can paddle in. This is a real flood. So let that small gap appear, and God's there. The wind blows in, the water streams through, and we receive more, as the prayer book says, than we can either desire or deserve. And as that happens, of course, the fruitfulness that Paul writes about begins. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? The end of those things is death, sterility, enclosure. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, the end, everlasting life. Let that crack appear, let that door open, and what happens is something generative, something productive. New life, and not only new life, but new life that is nourishing your fruit unto holiness. You are bearing fruit and that means, of course, that your life, instead of just being a system of endless feedback loop, becomes something that is nourishing for other human beings. How does that crack appear, the crack where the light gets in, in Leonard Cohen's much quoted line? How does the door begin to open? The life, and death and resurrection of Jesus is, you might say, God putting out his finger, working on the surface of our humanity, opening it up and flooding through. The life of Christ is a life in which that boundless, immeasurable energy of love, which is God, has fully soaked through a human life and is bearing fruit becoming nourishing for others. When we ourselves come close to Christ, when we hear his voice, when we let his hand touch us, when we take in our hands and in our bodies the bread and the wine of the sacrament, that's what's going on. We're allowing a dangerous gap where the draft can get in, a tiny hole which will gradually be widened by the pressure and flood of God's love. And this morning's gospel gives us the most vivid possible worked example of this. Here is a huge crowd of hungry people. How are they to be fed? The disciples in this version of the story, or of course famously the little boy with his sandwiches in the other versions of the story, the disciples bring a very, very small gift. We have seven loaves and we have Notice the language, a few small fishes. Something very small, something apparently insignificant is offered to God. God puts his hand on it, opens it up, prizes it open, and through it comes the nourishment that will feed this whole immense crowd. When we think of our own lives, our own futures, our own discipleship, our own aspirations to whatever holiness may be for us. One place we might begin is asking whether there is any small spot 
where we're blocking something off, some small change we can make, some small adjustment to our habitual self-reference, which if we address it in prayer and patience, might just open up to God. It may be simply a move to bring reconciliation with somebody with whom we're at odds or with whom our relationship has been in tension. It may be the decision to respond to, let's say, an appeal for humanitarian aid from some afflicted part of the world. It may be simply sitting down quietly with a cup of coffee, listening for a bit to what's around you, listening to the almost silent but actually buzzing and active environment we're in, picking up the small sounds, the small creaks and hints and quirks that surround us. It may be the willingness to go for a walk, breathing deeply and letting our anxiety slip aside. All of these things are examples, you might say, of loaves and fishes put into the hands of God. Small things through which God can make a great entrance. I've always rather loved the fact that in the Eastern Orthodox liturgy, the moment when the bread and the wine are solemnly taken into the sanctuary is called the great entrance. It's not just that that is a, a moment of rather elaborate ceremonial, a procession with chanting and the holy gifts held up on high and the candles borne in front of them. It's also something about the other entrance that's going on the entrance of God, the great entrance of God into our own lives. The wind blowing through the little drafty corner, the water streaming through what looked like such a tiny gap in the roof. And so, as we come to share in this Holy Eucharist, we are bringing our loaves and fishes. We're bringing our willingness to make some small changes, some small steps, bringing those to God in Christ. As an earnest of the fact that we really do want to get away from the slavery of the echo chamber. We want to hear, we want to feed. And among the things we simply can't do for ourselves as human beings is speak ourselves into language and feed ourselves into life. That's why we need parents. That's why we need human beings around us. And so when it comes to God, the same applies. We need to hear. We need to be spoken into language. We need to be fed into life. And the very small steps we take to open to God, the very small steps we take away from that malign recycling of ourselves that goes on in the world of sin, who knows what God can do with them? God feeds that enormous multitude in the desert at the hands of Christ, when Christ takes the paltry gifts we give. God turns us into agents of his love. We, small things, become channels of that endless love and life. But we start with a little bit of diagnosis, the diagnosis that St. Paul offers. The wages of sin is death. Sinful behavior is behavior that simply echoes back to the self what the self thinks it wants or needs and is greedy to get. One very wise teacher said that the heart of the problems of human beings was that we get what we don't want and we want what we don't get. And in the echo chamber, we get what we think we want, and yet it's not what we need or most deeply want, because it just reflects back to us what we bring to it. Rubbish in, rubbish out. But let once the alien but wonderful voice of God break through. Let once the flood of God's love and the wind of God's spirit come through. And then we bear fruit. We become ourselves nourishment for others. 
we are nourished. We are spoken and fed into life. And as we come to our Holy Communion, whether receiving it literally, materially, or receiving it spiritually as this morning, that's what we pray. Speak to us, Lord. Speak us into your language, your word. Feed us, Lord. Feed us with your life for all eternity. Amen. <laughs>